I now give the floor to His Excellency, the Permanent Representative of Sri Lanka. <coughs> Uh, prevention of conflicts and protection of populations from atrocity crimes and large-scale human rights violations remains a primary responsibility of states. Indeed, uh, we will recall that in the 2005 World Summit Outcomes document, we, the UN members, reaffirmed their responsibility to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. We committed ourselves to, to assist each other to fulfill this responsibility and to act collectively when states failed, manifestly failed, to protect their populations from these crimes. And this perhaps was the first time that we committed ourselves internationally to protect populations from atrocity crimes. Mr. Chairman, the phrase crimes against humanity has acquired enormous resonance, if I was to use that expression, in the legal and moral imaginations of the post-World War II world. It suggests, in, and in, at least in two distinct ways, the enormity of these offenses. First, we will appreciate that the, the very phrase, crimes against humanity, suggests offenses that aggrieve not only the victims in their own communities, but all human beings, regardless of their community. We also see, secondly, the phrase suggesting that these offenses cut deep, violating the core humanity that we all share, and that distinguishes us from other natural beings. Mr. Chairman, this dual meaning, I say, must be appreciated and gives it great power, great potency. But it also at the same time gives ambiguity. And ambiguity, I say, that we may trace back to this dual meaning the word, of the word humanity. Because humanity can mean both the quality of being human, the humaneness, and the aggregation of all human beings, humankind as such. So crimes against humanity, we must appreciate, has the, that defining feature of the offenses being the value they injure, namely humanness. So we also must appreciate that the law traditionally distinguishes between crimes against persons, crimes against property, crimes against public order, crimes against morals, and, and so on and so forth. Here, the idea the academics say is to supplement the traditional taxonomy of legally protected values, property, person, public order, morals, by adding some offenses which are crimes against human, humanness as such. So the discussion on crimes against humanity takes the term seriously at face value. Treating humanity as an operative concept with intelligible normative content and not just a placeholder in a legal term of art. Secondly, the academics seem to say that discussions of crimes against humanity draw on both senses. The word humanity, humanity as humanness, as humanity as humankind. So the central question, Mr. Chairman, for any theory on the war of crimes against humanity are uh, how these deeds violate humanness and why they offend against humankind. And this needs to be examined very closely. So labeling something a crime against humanity will, 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 will imply both conclusions. But it is important for us to realize that violating humanness and offending humankind are not the same thing. They are not equivalent. Arguably, all human beings share an interest in suppressing grave acts of environmental destruction, an interest that may well justify making such acts international crimes. But the value that is harmed must be appreciated is not, strictly speaking, human at all. Conversely, and especially a sadistic rape for perhaps or murder might degrade humanity of its victim without implicating the interests of the entire human race. 
so crimes against humanity are simultaneously we must appreciate offenses against humankind and injuries to humanness. They are, all, they are so universally odious, I say, that they make the criminal hostis humani generis, as we say it in Latin, an enemy of all humankind, like the pirate on the high seas, under traditional international law. So, Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, an assessment of these situations shows that atrocity crimes are most likely to occur in situations of, of course, armed conflict. But genocide and crimes against humanity have also occurred outside the conflict situation. This fact underlies the importance, I say, of paying attention to understanding and reacting to the early warning signs of atrocity crimes. However, we as the international community must move beyond early warning alone and insist on early action. Acting early not only increases the likelihood of being able to address the risk before it becomes a crisis, it also is more cost effective than responding once a crisis is ongoing, when stakes are higher and the options are, fewer, are much fewer. I leave you with those thoughts, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for giving me this floor. Thank you. I, think, I thank uh, His Excellency the permanent representative of Sri Lanka for his important statement.